In this Godot multiplayer tutorial, I'll teach you how you can sync the position of your players so they can see each other move around. Let's get started. In the last tutorial, I've shown you this layout between the client and the game server. Let's quickly recap in 20 seconds what we'll do this tutorial and what we'll save for other tutorials so you got a bite-sized chunk that you can chew. In this tutorial, we'll send the player state 60 times per second to the server. Server will collect it into a collection. It will process it 20 times per second. So we'll also be changing that tick rate. We'll then send it out back to the clients. We'll skip the buffering, interpolation, extrapolation, and all that good stuff. Now we'll just focus on updating that position. No rotation or animation yet. Just make sure we go full circle and we got a foundation on which we can build in the next episodes. Now let's dive into the code. We're gonna start this tutorial off on the client side player script. The player state that we have to be sending to the server is all about variables regarding the player, the rotation, the position, the state. So it makes sense to me if we put this on the player script. I started on the top where we got a new variable, player state, that's the output we need to be sending to the server. And I'm starting off by setting my physics process engine off. I do that because I don't have anything like a main menu or something like that. I get nothing in between actually a player on the map. I get nothing to buffer and therefore I don't want to start sending my location off to the server if I don't have a positive network token verification yet. So I'm turning it off here but if you get something like a main menu you probably won't have to do this. Quickly going to the game server singleton, the interface to the game server. If we have a positive uh, token verification result, then I'm going to get the node player and I'm going to set that physics process back to true. So that's how I'm turning it off and, and back on, but that's most likely not necessary for you if you already got a game menu in there. If you're still testing things or prototyping, you probably are going to need this. So with that done, here we have the physics process engine, which we already had the movement loop from tutorial number one, but now we also have the defined player state. Now, before we dive into the player state, let me quickly show you that currently I've searched for physics in my project settings and under common, currently my physics FPS is 60. So that means that this function is called 60 times per second, the same frame rate with which we want to send that player state to the server. The defined player state is nothing more than a timestamp, which we get by the operating system get time in milliseconds, and a position, get global position. Now, as you can see, I've shortened position and timestamp for P and T. And I do that because we're going to be sending this 60 times per second to the server. And with any opportunity we have to reduce the amount of bytes that this packet is big, we will be reducing the load on the bandwidth of the connection that between the player and the server. Um, if we can reduce the amount of bytes that we have to transfer per packet, then we can basically save the player some data. Uh, it will speed things up. And especially if you're pro programming something for a mobile audience, you definitely wouldn't want the data roaming of your players to be immediately screwed once they played your game for 15 seconds. So any saving of bytes that you can achieve, take it. So with that said, we're going to call the singleton game server, the interface to the game server still on the client here. We're going to send that player state. Going to that singleton, the send player state is pretty straightforward. It's an RPC unreliable call. First time we use an unreliable call in this entire uh, tutorial series. We're going to call the function receive player state. We send it only to the server and we push that player state in there. I've got a print here to demonstrate to you how this works. But of course, you want to be removing that print as soon as you verify that it works because those prints are going to be printing 60 times a second. That's quite intensive for the CPU. So with that said, we can switch to the game server. Now I'm on the game server project. I'm on the game server um, uh, script. The first thing I've done on the top is create a new variable player state collection. This is where we'll collect all the player state from the various players that we are collecting states of. Now this is going to be a dictionary and the keys of this dictionary will be the pair IDs or player IDs of the various players. Now that function that's being called by the players, the receive player state, we're first be defining that player ID or peer ID. 
then what we'll do is we'll basically have to be adding that player ID to the player um, state collection um, and then push that player state in there. However, we don't always want to do that. Sometimes it can be that the player state that's being received by the server is actually older than a state it has already received. Because of how the internet works, you cannot be guaranteed that the order with which the player sends out its states is the same, time, same order as that the server is going to be receiving those states. So the last thing we would want is that we replace a newer state with an older state. Therefore, if the player state collection already has a state of this player, we're first going to check if the state that it currently has, the T for timestamp, is smaller than the timestamp of the newly received player state. And if that is the case, we'll be replacing that currently known player state with the received player state. Now, of course, we can only do this check if the pair ID actually exists. And that's why we have this last L statement here. And basically this statement is for a new player logging in, sending its player state for the very first time, because that is simply not going to have that. Future Stefan here, I forgot a line of code. I'm right here on the game server on the function peer disconnect. And of course, as soon as a player logs off, disconnects or whatever, we want to erase that peer ID out of the player state collection Otherwise, we would be gathering garbage. So make sure you put that line in there and you should be good. So with that done, we now have a collection of player states, which is always the latest. We're not going to keep a whole history of all these player states. That's not necessary. This is basically just always going to be overriding the player state of a single player with the latest version. All right. Now that we have that, we're going to go to a new node called state processing. New node in the uh, in the hierarchy here. You can also make it a singleton, as I explained in episode number two, I believe. When we go to this script, first thing on the top, world state. And we're going to do this in the physics process engine. But we only want to do this 20 times per second. So again, project, project settings. I search for physics in the comments section. I set the physics FPS to 20 so that automatically our server now ticks at 20 times per second. First, we check if that state is empty, which would basically mean there's not a single player connected. If there's no player connected, then we don't have to run anything. Well, if that is not empty, um, then we're going to be processing it. The first thing we have to do is we want to make a snapshot of that player collection. However, the way dictionaries work, I can't just say world state, which would be uh, a new dictionary. So we could define it as a new dictionary. We cannot say that the world state dictionary is going to be the other dictionary because that will only create a reference to the same location in the memory. In other words, if I would do that and I would change something in the world state, I'm also changing it in the player collection. And as I'm going through the world state, if a new player sends a new state, that is then also going to be received by this world state. And otherwise, I'm not making a copy. I'm just making a reference to the same thing, to the same dictionary. So. Go that comes with a function called duplicate, and it, that function duplicate comes with a um, possible variant, a boolean, whether you want a deep copy or not. A deep copy means that if there's any nested dictionaries or nested arrays, those will be duplicated as well into a new section of the memory. So of course, we want to have a deep copy as all these player states are dictionaries within the player state collection dictionary. So now that we have a deep duplicate of the player state collection that we can start processing, we're now gonna go for every player in world state keys. We go over every single key. We're gonna erase the time uh, stamp because the timestamp only of the world state is important. The various timestamps of the players are not very important. Because they're not important, we want to erase them again for the same reason. We want to make sure that again, those bytes of that packet is as small as possible. If we don't need that timestamp of the player, then we should erase it out of here. So you erase all these timestamp, then we are defining a new timestamp, a hierarchy higher for the world state. So not for every single player in the world state, but a timestamp for the world state. Again, operating system get time in milliseconds. We get the parent that will be the main game server script and we send the world state out to the players. 
Now, very quickly, how does that look? Super easy. Send world state, receives the world state, RPC unreliable call again, zero, meaning everybody re send and we call for the function receive world state and we send that world state off to all the players that are currently connected. So now back on the client side of the project, on the game server, the interface to the game server, the singleton, here we have the remote function receive world state. We're gonna print it again, just for testing purposes to demonstrate it to you. Delete this as soon as you have verified that it works. We're gonna get the node map and we're gonna update the world state. I've chosen the map node as the node to be processing this information as the map is sort of the uh, uh, parent of all the elements that could need changing, being players, being mobs, being NPCs, being uh, resource nodes, everything basically lives as an entity on the map. That's why I put this code on the map uh, script. So going to the map script, where we have the update world state uh, function right here. This is where we would also then buffer, interpolate, extrapolate, rubber band, and all that good stuff that's going to come up in the next couple of episodes. First thing we check, we have a new variable on the top, last world state. We define it as zero because otherwise we run into an error on the very first world state that this player is going to receive. We're going to check if the timestamp of the world state that has been received is bigger than the last world state. In other words, same reason as why we check that timestamp on the server side. The packets that are being sent by the server to the player do not necessarily arrive in the same order as we send them. Last thing we want is to move a player to possession X, then accidentally receive a later player state or world state, put the player back and then have to quickly rubber band him forward again because then we receive an actual up-to-date world state. We wouldn't want such behavior with players moving back and forth because packets are not arriving in the same order. <clears throat> so we're first gonna check if that world, the timestamp of that received world state is indeed bigger than the last world state that we have processed. Now, if that is the case, then we're gonna be replacing the timestamp of the last world state with this world state's timestamp, because now this will be the latest <coughs> world, stand, world state that we have processed. A lot of, lot of states here, a lot of states. Then what we do is we wanna clean up that world state so we can process it because we wanna go and iterate over every single player in that world state and set its position. But we want two um, um, keys of the dictionary, one out of there so we can loop over it. The first one is the T for timestamp. We don't wanna loop over of that. We basically already use that and don't need it anymore. But we will require this in later episodes when we start interpolating and extrapolating. But then we'll just change the code to work with that. For now, we'll erase it. Then another one we want to delete is the uh, player state of the player that's actually received that world, this world state. Because of course, this player is also sending out this player state. So that will end up in the world state. And we don't wanna be setting the position of this player based on this world state because we're processing the local player locally. So we also delete that pair ID out of the world state dictionary keys. Then what's left is only other players. And for every other player that's left in world state keys, we're gonna check if that player already exists on the client using that spawn player from the last episode, link up there. If we have that node, then we're gonna get that node and we're gonna run the function move player and we will be forwarding this specific player's position. Now, if this container does not have this player node yet, that means that we have to spawn that player in first. So we're gonna be spawning the player uh, and we just do that using the same function as we used in the last episode. We push forward the player ID and we push forward the position. Those are the same two variables that we needed in the last episode to spawn a player. Now, I hear you ask a question and you're absolutely right. This function would also could also replace the spawn call that we created in the last episode. If you remember from the last episode, we did spawn in all new players joining the game that a player was already in, but we did not spawn any players that were already in the game for the player that just joined. Now, this will fix that last issue. So now both players will be able to see each other. But with this function, you would also do it the other way around. So you wouldn't need that spawn new player call that we currently have when a new player connects to the server. However, 
we might want to do some extra things with a player that just joined. Maybe we want to, you know, make sure that it's invincible for five seconds while his screen renders or loads. I know a lot of games have that. Maybe he loads into a PvP zone and, you know, the moment he gets his screen, he's already dead. So to identify a newly joining player from a player that's already been in the game is kind of handy to have this distinction and have two ways to spawn that player in. However, we do of course have to make sure that we don't accidentally double spawn this player, which there will be a very tiny fraction of a time window, um, uh, there, there is a chance for that. So I've added this extra line of code on the spawn new player function that basically checks if that player uh, or that node doesn't already exist in that container. Just to be 100% sure that that minuscule time window where basically these signals could arrive at the same time, we're not spawning the same player in twice. So with that said, we now pretty much have all um, the players updating their position. All we have to do is check this move player function, but that is a super easy function. It's of course on the player template that we made in the last episode. All we do here is based on this new position, we set the new position of all the other players. With that done, I think it's time for a little demonstration. Now what we want to see of course is two players moving around, um, but we also want to make sure that we check those prints and to see indeed if we send those player states about three times for every single world state that we receive. That will be an interesting one to see as well. I've already uh, entered the right username and passwords for two different players. So I'm going to log in on one client. I'm going to log in on my second client. Now I got two players on top of each other, but when I move one around it immediately bumps out of there because the collision shapes basically immediately pull them apart. So now this player can walk around and as you can see on the bottom screen, the red hat player is now moving around. It doesn't have animation or right orientation or rotation yet, but we are moving around. And if I were to click here, you see this one move as well. If I were to click this one next to the web there, now I can quickly switch here and move here as well. And as you can see, it all just works splendid. Now, if we quickly have a look, I'll turn these two off and I'll go to one of the outputs and I'll zoom in a little bit. Here you can see that we're sending three player states for every world state that we receive. Our player states are the player position and the timestamp. The world state is a player peer ID or player ID with its position, second player with position and the timestamp of the world state. As you can see, that timestamp of the player has been erased from this dictionary as we had programmed, thereby reducing the size of this dictionary we are sending over 20 times per second and thereby reducing the bandwidth requirements for the player. So that all looks good. I think you can get some players moving. That was it for today guys, hope you like it. If you did, smash that like button, hit subscribe. Don't forget that little bell icon to make sure that you don't miss out on any of those episodes that are gonna come up on topics like buffering, interpolation, extrapolation, lag compensation, you name it. We're gonna cover all of those elements that you need to make a proper multiplayer game. Now, if you're curious about the stuff that I do myself, apart from all these tutorials, I'm actually making a 3D multiplayer strategic RPG called Soul Whisperer, and I'm live streaming the development three hours every Tuesday and Thursday right here on this YouTube channel. So make sure you hit that bell icon and whenever you see that pop up of a live stream, that means I'm showing you how I'm struggling when I'm not making a tutorial because these tutorials make things look easy, but you know, all game does struggle uh, uh, multiple times per day, I would say. And sometimes it can be really, uh, really good to see that uh, everybody is doing that. You know, may, might uplift you a little bit. At the same time, of course, you can ask me any question in that stream regarding how I look at things, what certain design decisions, or, you know, just ask me some personal questions. I'm a pretty open book. So hope to see you there. And until then, keep on gaming, keep on coding. See you later, guys.